The Emergence of Kurdish Nationalism Kurdish Nationalism from 1908 to 1924 The Young Turk Revolution of 1908, beginning the third stage of Kurdish nationalism, led immediately to the public establishment of Kurdish nationalist organizations, especially in the capital city of Istanbul. The first one was the Kurdish Society for Progress and Mutual Aid, sometimes called Society for the Rise and Progress of Kurdistan. The society included some of the most illustrious sons of famous Kurdish families. The leadership of nationalist organizations also indicated that sons of former Kurdish emirs had sought and obtained educations, while the tribal leaders were commanding the Hamadiyya. Among the founders of the society were Emir Emin Ali Badir Khan, Sheikh Abdul Qadi of Neri, son of Sheikh Ubaidallah, General Muhammad Sheriff Pasha, and Mushadu Al Kifil Pasha, a roll call of Kurdish illuminaries, among whom the Badir Khans predominated. The society established a cultural affiliate, Society for the Propagation of Kurdish Education, that published a magazine. Kurdistan, that was a continuation of the same newspaper that had been published by Sharia Beg Badir Khan in Cairo. In Istanbul he remained its principal contributor. The society also built a school for the Kurdish population in Istanbul, which in 1908 numbered about 30,000. The school was attended by Syed Kurdi or Nursi, who subsequently became an influential Kurdish Islamic leader and the exponent of Nurjuluk. Society for the Rise and Progress of Kurdistan was shut down in 1909 by the Young Turks, who saw no advantage in allowing Kurds to organize. A second organization, Kurdish Hope Society, was founded in 1912. The establishment of a second organization was indicative of the rivalry and differences among the Kurds of Istanbul. The Hope Society was an organization of Kurdish students some of whom came from the Hamidiyya schools established by Abdulhamid II. According to Van Bruinissen, its members were sons of urban, Ottomanized notables. They belonged to the same social stratum as most young Turks, their romantic nationalism paralleled that of the Turkish nationalists. This is one of the reasons that a number of Kurdish nationalists were among the founders and supporters of the Committee for Union and Progress such as Isaac Sukuti, Abdullah Sevdit, Obdurman Badir Khan, Hikmet Baban, Ismail Haq Baban, and Suleiman Nazif. Zia Gokalp, one of the leading contributors to Turkish nationalism, was a Kurd from Diyarbakir. But like the founders of Society for the Rise and Progress of Kurdistan, they were quite divorced from their people in eastern Anatolia, who were still traditional and religious and whose idea of nationalism was still tied to the caliphate especially as that office had been exercised by Abdulhamid II. The officers and leaders of the Hamidiyya were not yet sufficiently willing to cooperate with their citified brethren. The catalyst of World War I was needed to bring about that cooperation. Experiencing the common calamities of the war helped to bring the Western intellectuals and the Eastern tribesmen and Sheikhs together. In a way, World War I had an impact on Kurdish nationalism similar to that of the Hamidiyya era. Although World War I was much shorter than the decade and a half of the Hamidiyya era, its immense impact on the Ottoman Empire and the devastation wreaked in Kurdistan forced the Westerners and Easterners closer together, and enabled more cooperation after the war. By 1908, the idea of Kurdish nationalism had become better known and had grown. Even if it did not follow the path hoped by the Kurdish nationalists, romantic and otherwise, in Istanbul. In Kurdistan, the nationalist ideas found their way into the Tarakots and Tekiyas, where the Sheikhs became their ardent supporters. Wadi Jwaideh thinks this was a development of great significance in the history of Kurdish nationalism. For a number of reasons, the importance of the Tekiyas as centers for the dissemination of nationalist ideas can scarcely be exaggerated. The ideas emanating from these focal points found ready and wide acceptance among the Kurds, for they bore the stamp of authority of the sheikhs. Moreover, the religious character and influence of the sheikhs gave the Tekiyas relative immunity from interference and harassment by the authorities. The importance of this was clearly demonstrated in the Iranian Revolution in the 1980s. 
the sheikhs, who as a class represented an important segment of the Kurdish elite, were ardent nationalists. Unlike the largely Turkified urban Kurdish elite, they were closely associated with the Kurdish masses, and identified themselves with them. Furthermore, both by training and conviction they stood for the traditional Islamic state as Turks, opposed to the modern secular state envisaged by the young Turks. The attitude and position of the Sheikhs can be understood from a petition they submitted to the young Turk government soon after it came to power. Sheikhs Abdul Salam Barzan and Nur Muhammad of Dok delivered the petition, which consisted of the following seven points. 1. Adopt Kurdish administration in five Kurdish causes, administrative districts. 2. Adopt Kurdish as the language of instruction in the Kurdish areas. 3. The appointment of Kurdish speaking Kamakams and Mudirs, both administrative officials, as well as other officials. 4. Administration of law and justice should be according to the Shariat, Sharia. 5. The positions of Qadi, religious judge, and Mufti, canon law lawyer responsible for delivering formal legal opinions, to be filled by adherents of the Shafi school of law. 6. Taxes to be levied in accordance with the Shariat. 7. Taxes collected for the exemption from labor service to remain in effect provided they were set aside for the repair and maintenance of roads in the five Kurdish causes. As Juwaida has emphasized, numbers 1, 2, 3, and 7 were expressions of Kurdish nationalism, 4, 5, and 6 reflected religious views. The fifth point, however, points out the subtlety of the Sheikh's position, for the appointment of Qadis and Muftis of the Shafi school to which the majority of Kurds belong, was tantamount to demanding the recognition of the paramountcy of the right. This, of course, would have meant the establishment of a Kurdish national church. This was the historical pattern that had been followed by the Greek Orthodox peoples of the Balkans. But events were not to turn out as propitiously for the Kurds as for the Balkan peoples. The Kurds were confronted with a Turkish nationalism much stronger than their own that eventually advocated dismantling of the religious institutions that supported the Sheikhs. As the petition makes clear, many of the Sheikhs had nationalist goals, but they could not be pursued without religious institutions and government tolerance. When the Sheikhs realized that the young Turk government was antagonistic, they staged constant rebellions from 1908 through the war and after the armistice. In Istanbul Kurdish nationalists joined the opposition parties such as the Freedom and Accord Party. One of the leaders of this party was Mevlanzadi Rafat, the publisher of the Sebesti, Freedom, newspaper that printed articles by Kurdish nationalists such as Kamaran Badir Khan. In 1914, Jeladet Badir Khan wrote an article that was printed by the Sebesti Press. Rawan Duzlufan Azadla, another Kurdish nationalist, was the general secretary of the Freedom and Accord Party. Utilizing his position, he was able to gather a group of 150 Kurdish nationalists around him. Abdullah Jevdet and Ibrahim Temo created the Ottoman Democratic Party, which also offered opposition in parliament. Another Kurdish nationalist, Lutfi Fikri, was active against the Committee of Union and Progress. In 1910, he began the Moderate Freedom Party and also published for a time the newspaper Reform. With the outbreak of the war in 1914, however, Kurdish nationalists' activities, whether in support of or in opposition to the government or the Committee of Union and Progress, had to be subordinated to the patriotic cause of defending the homeland. Throughout the war, Kurdistan was engulfed in the war zones. The theater of operations extended from Sarkamash, in the north, to Kanakin in the south, to Erzingen in the west. It is difficult to determine how many Kurds participated in the war as soldiers, the numbers in different accounts vary widely. Muhammad Zaki states that the 11th Army headquartered at Elazg and the 12th Army at Mosul were made up entirely of Kurds. The majority of the officers and soldiers of the 9th Army at Erzurum and the 10th Army at Sivas were also Kurds. The Kurds also contributed 135 squadrons of reserve cavalry and a number of frontier units and numerous gendarmes, 
Zaki estimates that the Kurds suffered 300,000 casualties, which would imply that well over half a million Kurds served in the war. That would seem to be high. The Kurds did sustain heavy losses in battles against the Russian forces. In 1916, the 60th and 61st Corps in the HNS and Passenler Front suffered heavy casualties in one battle. There were several such battles. On 15 July 1916, the Ottoman, Kurdish, forces fought another major engagement with the Russians. Sheriff Firet does not give casualty figures, but they must have been heavy, the battle resulted in a Russian retreat. The number of Kurds that perished from famine, disease, and cold was probably greater than the losses sustained in the war against the Russians and in the civil war with the Armenians. It is difficult to determine the population of the Kurds in the Ottoman Empire, let alone in Turkey or in eastern Anatolia. The debate concerning the number of Armenians who perished in World War I, however, has made statistics, whatever their reliability, available. The statistics for the Kurdish population in eastern Anatolia compiled by the Armenian Patriarchate were Erzurum, 75,000, Van, 72,000, Bitlis, 77,000, Mamirechelazis or Harput, present-day Elazg, 95,000, Diyarbakr, 95,000, Sivas, 50,000, a total of 464,000 or 16.3% of the total population of the six eastern vilayets. Provinces. Turks represented 25.4% and Armenians 38.9%. The Patriarchate, however, did not include the Kazelbash, 140,000, Zazars, 77,000, or Yezidis, 37,000, in the Kurdish figures. If we leave out the Yezidis, since they are not usually considered Kurds, but include the Kazelbash and Zazars figures, we come up with the sum of 681,000 Kurds as compared to 666,000 Turks, or 1,018,000 Armenians. Thus, by the Patriarchate figures the Kurdish and Turkish populations were about equal. Justin McCarthy in a recent work based on Ottoman population censuses, and other population statistics for the years 1911 and 1912, adjusted in accordance with accepted demographic calculations, gives only the figures for Muslims in the Vilayets and does not give separate figures for Turks and Kurds. His figures for the Muslim population of the six eastern Vilayets are, Erzurum, 804,388, Van, 313,322, Bitlis, 408,703, Mamirechelazis, 564,164, Diyarbakir, 598,985, Sivas, 1,196,300, a total of 3,885,862 Muslims. If we leave out Sivas, which the Kurds did not claim, the total figure for Muslims in the remaining five vilayets would be 2,689,562, ,00 at least half of whom were probably Kurdish. Based on the Patriarchate figures of 1912, Hovenision believes that there were at least as many Muslims as Christians. McCarthy concludes from his research that all Anatolian provinces had overwhelming Muslim majorities, not simply pluralities. He calculates that if all Anatolian Armenians had immigrated to the six vilayets, Muslims still would have outnumbered Armenians more than 2.5 to 1. If the Kurds were roughly half of the Muslim population, then they would have had a ratio of 1.25 to 1 for the Armenians. If the Vilayet of Sivas is dropped from these calculations, the ratio percentage would be even greater, and this is after all Anatolian Armenians had immigrated to the six Vilayets in question. McCarthy calculates the devastating effect that World War I had on the Muslim population. Again using just the statistics from the six vilayets, see Table 1. Table 1. Population of the six eastern vilayets of Anatolia in 1912 and 1922.
Thus, 41.9% of the 2.5 million Muslims who died in the period of World War, one died in the six vilayets of eastern Anatolia or, put in other terms, 7.6% of the total Muslim population. The Kurds were at least half of the 7.6% or 500,000. In 1919, after an extensive tour through Diyarbakir vilayet, Captain Noel, a British agent of whom more will be said later, estimated that the pre-war population was 994,000, of which 750,000 were Kurdish and 3,000 Turkish. His post-war estimate was a total population of 648,500, a loss of 345,500. He estimated the post-war Kurdish population at 600,000 and the Turks at 2,500, a wartime loss of 150,500, of which 150,000 were Kurdish and only 500 Turkish. Given McCarthy's calculations, Noel's figures seem quite high for the total population of Diyarbakir Vilayet, high for the Kurdish and absurdly low for the Turkish. Noel's figures are all the more interesting in that he was the main British agent in Kurdistan, both in Anatolia and in Iraq, from 1919 to 1922. His figures and information played an important role in British policy toward Turkey and the Kurds during this period. There is another set of figures for the eastern provinces for 1931. Two British consuls, Roberts and Ravensdale, travelled through the areas under discussion from 26 June to the 11th of July 1931 and gave the following figures. Erzurum, 300,000, Van, 80,000, Kars, 208,000, Malaysia, 300,000, Elaz, 200,000, and IDR, 104,000. Roberts and Ravensdale gave no figures for Diyarbakir or Sivas. Also, the Vilayet structure had been changed by 1931. It is difficult to make comparisons since the new Vilayets overlapped with the older six Vilayets. But the figures are substantially lower than those given by McCarthy. These figures for the capitals of the Vilayets and the towns and villages through which Roberts and Ravensdale passed are also shockingly low. For example, they recorded the following figures, Malaysia, 20,000, Harput, 12,000 to 15,000, Bitlis, 12,000, Ursus, 3,000, Van, 5,000, Karakos, 3,000 to 4,000, Kars, 12,000, and Erzurum, 25,000. Roberts and Ravensdale's account is similar to Alex K. Helms's report on the same provinces in 1929. He recorded these figures, Ilaz, Ilazes, 13,000, Diyarbakir, 30,000, Malaysia, 14,000, Sivas, 29,000, and Jayasun, 8,000. A few months after Helms's journey, W. S. Edmonds, another British consul, reported the following statistics. Gaziantep, 15,000 to 20,000, Urfa, 20,000, Bitlis, 5,000, and Meuse, 3,000. The figures given by the British consuls and officials suggest post-war population figures lower than those of McCarthy. But until McCarthy's figures are challenged or proven wrong, they provide a reasonable assessment of the great destruction wrought in eastern Anatolia on the Muslim and Kurdish populations. It only pales in comparison with the destruction of the Armenians. It was suggested above that probably more than 500,000 Kurds died in Turkey proper during World War I. When one adds to this figure the deaths of Kurds in Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Russia, it is likely the total deaths among the Kurdish population neared the 1 million mark. Muhammad Amin Zaki and Wadi Jwaide give detailed accounts of the destruction in northern Iraq. Zaki states that 300,000 Kurds were casualties of the war. A Kurdish source suggests that 700,000 Kurds were forced to evacuate their places of residence. Basil Nikitin, a Russian consul who was present in the area during the war, attests to the same terrible conditions and death in Kurdistan in Iran. The armistice between the Allies and Ottomans was signed on 31 October 1918. This event was to mark a resurgence in Kurdish nationalist activity. 
the Kurdish Society for Progress and Mutual Aid was reactivated in 1918 as the Society for the Rise of Kurdistan. Unlike its predecessor, which had consisted largely of educated and urban nationalists, the new organization also included members from the tribes. Van Bruinissen has given a list of the members of the society, notable because of its indication of the new direction of Kurdish nationalism after World War I. The officers included as president, Syed Abdul Qadi, the son of the famous Ubaidallah, as first vice president, General Fuad Pasha of Suleymaniyya, as secretary general, Hamdi Pasha, a retired member of the general staff, and as treasurer, Syed Abdullah, a son of Abdul Qadi. The military committee consisted of Miralay, Colonel, Halid Beg from Dur Sim, head of the Istanbul police, Mehmet Ali Badir Khan, a retired colonel, and Mehmet Emin Beg of Suleymaniyya, a retired lieutenant colonel. Among the religious officials were Kweka Ali Effendi and Sifik Effendi from Irvas. Other members were Barbanzad Sukri Beg, editor-in-chief of the newspaper Turkuman, Barbanzad Fuad Beg, Fethala, a trader, and Sukri Mehmet, a professor of medicine. Other members also included Ali Shan Beg of the Kochgiri region in Dersim, which was to stage a rebellion in 1920. The Kurdish Hope Society was also revived, and it subsequently merged with a faction at the Society for the Rise of Kurdistan composed of younger and more radical members to form the Kurdish Social Organization Society. According to Van Bruinissen, the split occurred when Syed Abdul Qadi, and possibly the Badir Khans, publicly declared that his aim was not an independent Kurdistan but rather a limited form of autonomy. Many of the Badir Khans joined with the young nationalists. The Kurdish Social Organization Society seems to have been effective due to support from the Kurdish population in Istanbul. The members of the society were instrumental in forming the Society for Kurdish Freedom, which was later renamed Society for Kurdish Independence. It was this organization that was to play an important role in the Sheikh Said Rebellion. Wadi Dwide states that almost immediately after the armistice a recrudescence of Kurdish nationalist activities took place. This was not only because of the efforts of the Kurds but also because of active Turkish support. The British wanted to use Kurds against the Turks, and promised the Kurds a form of autonomy within a Turkish-dominated state under the suzerainty of the Sultan Caliph, who would, of course, be a Turk. As we shall see, the Turks continued to offer a limited autonomy to the Kurds right up to the signing of the Treaty of Lausanne on 24 July, 1923. Turkish promises in this respect increased after Sheriff Pasha, the Kurdish representative at Versailles, signed an agreement with Boghaz Nubar, the Armenian representative, on 20 November 1919 in Paris that stated the Kurds would support Armenian independence and that the Armenians would support Kurdish independence. Both parties agreed to leave the settlement of boundaries to the peace conference. This development demonstrated that some Kurdish nationalists were not opposed to Armenian independence aspirations. It may well have been that some Kurdish nationalists felt less threatened by the Armenians in the wake of their deportation and massacre in the eastern provinces, where an independent Kurdish state would be established. They may also have felt some remorse over their own role, a major one. Another faction of the Kurdish nationalists was pan Islamic. It worked in cooperation with the Turkish groups that were actively anti British. But the primary goal of the pan Islamic group was to prevent the creation of an Armenian state. As early as January 1919, members of the Committee of Union and Progress were reportedly in Harput urging the Kurds to demand independence at the peace. Conference in Versailles. The leader of this movement was Ali Isan Pasha, former commander of the Ottoman Sixth Army. He was one of the Ottoman negotiators who had signed the armistice of Mudros, although he strongly disagreed with the terms. The activities in which he engaged were directed against the British action, especially the policy in Iraq. The British had occupied Mosul on 7 November 1918. This event increased Ottoman fears of further British expansion. 
Turkish support of Kurdish activities was part of a policy to deter British expansionism and support for an independent Armenia. The British were sure that Ali Isan did not favor an independent Kurdistan. Turkish support was meant as an embarrassment and impediment to Allied plans. It was an effective policy, but inherently risky. After the Greek occupation of Izmir in May 1919, the Greek killing of Turks was blamed on the British. The Kurds were apprehensive that a British-supported Armenian army in eastern Anatolia would take revenge for their role in the Armenian massacres just as the Armenians in the Russian army had done earlier. As a result, the Kurds supported the Turkish effort, which allowed them to get rid of the remaining Armenians, given the circumstances, the Turks could not allow this and risk international intervention. In June 1919, the Turkish-Kurdish clubs that were supporting Kurdish nationalist activities were abolished. The activities of the Committee of Union and Progress members in supporting Kurdish nationalist agitation confirm its role in leading resistance both before and after the commencement of Mustafa Kemal's resistance movement. Stanford Shaw and Ezel Shaw have made the observations that the CUP initiated resistance and was organized within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Eric Jan Zurcher's recent work demonstrates just how active the secret underground network of the CUP, Caracol, and the special organization were. He states that it is possible Mustafa Kemal went to Anatolia at the behest of Caracol. Mustafa Kemal's resistance campaign began in regions heavily Kurdish, probably with the blessing of the CUP. Mustafa Kemal's resistance movement coincided with the CUP's activities in southeast Anatolia in support of Kurdish resistance to the British and Armenians. The dilemma of the Kurds from the Armistice of Mudros, the 31st of October 1918, to the Treaty of Savries, the 10th of August 1920, centered on the question of autonomy or independence. The agreement between Sheriff Pasha and Boghaz Nubar of the 20th of November. 1919 confronted the Kurds with the necessity of declaring for a policy of autonomy or independence. We have seen that the Turkish reaction to the 20th of November agreement was to promise autonomy to the Kurds. Some Kurdish nationalists wanted independence, some, such as Emin Badir Khan, wanted separation from Turkey but recognition of the Sultan as Caliph. Badir Khan wanted the self-determination principles of President Wilson to be implemented in Kurdistan. Syed Abdul Qadi Khan seemed to straddle the fence. His inability to take a strong position for independence, or calculated decision as some historians would have it, led to the split mentioned above in the Society for the Rise of Kurdistan. In February and March 1920, Abdul Qadi made several statements to newspapers that he favored autonomy and supported Sheriff Pasha's efforts at Versailles. Emin Badir Khan and the intellectuals of the Society for the Rise of Kurdistan dismissed Abdul Qadi from his post as president after his statements. A historian of the Kurdish nationalist movement has written that the difference between Emin Ali Badir Khan and Syed Abdul Qadi is that the latter preferred the autonomy of a unified Kurdistan to a fragmented Kurdistan. Abdul Qadi hoped, apparently with the aid of Great Britain, to achieve a unified Kurdistan when circumstances made that possible. It is ironic that the Treaty of Savries provided for an independent Kurdistan, but not a unified one. Large parts of Kurdistan were to remain in Iraq and Iran. The goal of nationalists who were striving for a unified Kurdistan resulted in their lack of support for those Kurds who advocated independence, even as a region of Turkey. It is further ironic that those nationalists who advocated a unified Kurdistan sought the support of Great Britain, whose occupation of Iraq and influence in Iran had made it clear by the signing of the Treaty of Savries that there was to be no unified Kurdistan. Thus, those nationalists who favored an independent Kurdistan were forced to seek that independence in Turkey proper. After the 10th of August 1920, however, it was clear that they would be challenged by an exuberant nationalist Turkish movement. The question from August 1920 to the middle of 1921 was to what extent the British would support a Kurdish independence movement in Turkey. The evidence, as discussed in Chapter 3, 
is that Great Britain was not willing to support a Kurdish independence movement in Turkey in the face of the rising strength of Turkish nationalist forces. But British policy until the middle of 1921 was to encourage the Kurds to think that they would support independence efforts. During this period, the British supported these efforts in Turkey with the conviction they would not result in an independent state, but that the Kurds would be useful in obtaining concessions from the Turkish nationalist movement favorable to the British, especially along the Iraqi Turkish border. In short, those Kurdish nationalists who favored a unified Kurdistan through autonomy were confronted by a British policy that supported autonomy only in Iraq and not a unified Kurdistan. The unfolding events after the Treaty of Savries were to demonstrate how badly the autonomists had miscalculated. Not only did the autonomists lose power and influence, but the core of the Kurdish nationalist movement itself moved to Anatolia, from which the next battles would be waged.